Have I mentioned that I'm turning 30 this year? Obviously I have. I feel like I've been mentioning all the time, but then again, I'm not sure if that's actually true. It's certainly been on my mind a lot, and not for negative reasons, I'm pretty buzzed about my 30s. I feel like 30s are going to be a pretty good decade. I have a lot of hope and excitement and um, enthusiasm for the coming decade, but naturally turning 30, it having so much sort of societal baggage tied up in it, I guess. I've become a little bit reflective of the previous three decades of my life. And as part of that, I've been thinking a lot about books that I've read throughout my life and books that have come out during my life. And I wanted to make some content inspired by that. So today's video, as you can already tell from the title, is all about the top 10 books that came out in the 90s specifically that I have read. Naturally, with any video like this, <laughs> I am only talking about the best books of the books I have read and my favourites of a certain era or certain genre, but, you know, if I don't disclaim that, somebody's gonna come along and ask me why their one specific favourite book wasn't in this video. So, yeah, I want to talk about the 10 books that came out in the 90s that I enjoyed the most, that mean the most to me, that I think are the most impressive pieces of literature of what I've read, although they're not necessarily books I read in the 90s. In the 90s, I was ages one to eight, so I certainly wasn't reading a lot of adult literature, um, which means that all of the adult books in this video really were books I, I read after the 90s. However, they're all fantastic, and I would love to talk more about them and also just reflect a little bit back on and also just reflect back on that decade, the decade in which I was born, 1992 specifically, and some of the best books for me that came out that decade. It's always fun especially I think to think about things that came out on the year of your birth and that you then ended up loving because some of the books I'm going to mention in this video did come out in 1992 but I didn't read until I was say in my 20s and it's kind of amazing to think a book that you're sitting down and reading and enjoying was actually first coming out and first being published the same year you were born. But yeah, I think that pretty much covers the introduction, so without further ado, let's get in to the books. So this video actually begins in 1992, and that's not because I didn't want to talk about books from the 1990s or the 1991s. Is that how you phrase that? I don't think so. Um, but simply because when I was compiling this list, 1992 was the earliest book that made it, and there are a couple. So the first one I'm going to talk about is a absolute favourite of many people I know, and that's The Secret History by Donna Tartt. So this is such an interesting novel. It probably best falls into the category of literary fiction. It's a campus novel set on a university campus in North America and following a group of students studying classics. And they do Greek and Latin classes together. They learn about ancient history and philosophy and they slowly descend into an obsession with trying to recreate a Bacchanalia. Bacchus being the Roman equivalent of Dionysus, god of wine and parties and a Bacchanalia being a sort of ancient worship party in his honour. Now naturally they take things out of context and it all becomes a little bit more about um, their dynamics and relationships as a friendship group. Friends seems like an odd word to use for them given how they often treat each other and from the very offset of the novel you know that one of their number is destined to die. We find out at the very beginning that someone has died, but then we travel back in time to uh, the beginning of this novel from our protagonist's perspective when he first gets accepted into this university, and he's from a much more working class or lower middle class background um, than the rest of his friends that he ends up studying with, probably because classics has an association with the elite and the upper classes traditionally. And a large part of their dynamic when they're studying is his um, trying to fit in and sort of be one of their group despite very obviously being the outsider or at least very much feeling like the outsider when it comes to class and um, socio-economic background and naturally I love this book for its classical references. I, I love that it is full to the brim with references to Greek and Roman mythology and Greek and Roman history and culture but it's more than that. If it was just a book of references to Greek and Roman mythology it might not be quite as impressive but it's beautifully written. It's it's such a compelling novel and despite the fact that you know somebody dies from the offset of this novel that information doesn't take away from um, your all-consuming need 
to read through it. Every sentence is beautiful and it is quite slow because it spends so much time digging deep into the thoughts and feelings of the characters, into the atmosphere and their surroundings and each sentence just has so much in it that there's so much descriptive language. I think that naturally makes for a slower paced book but one that you are thoroughly involved in because of the writing and I really really enjoyed that. But despite the fact it is about classic students, it in no way mirrors my experience of university, which is worth saying, I think, only because I picked this book up thinking, yay, it's about classic students when I was a um, classical studies undergraduate. I think I was in my final year at university when I read this book after my friend David recommended it to me very explicitly because according to him, it was our life story. And then I read it and had to say to David, where have you been going to uni? Who have you been spending time with and who have you murdered? Because this is nothing like my experience of university. But then at the same time, it's always just fun to read about people studying your subject area and who you can relate to the references of in terms of their degree, even if not their lives. So I really enjoyed this book on multiple levels, a very personal one and on a much like wider one of it just being really, really, really well written. Another book that came out in 1992 that I read for the first time in my 20s was Poor Things by Alistair Gray. This is a book that I actually read because it was on my dad's bookshelf. I think it might be beneath the sofa so I can't um, get to it at the moment. And my friend Jen was also a big fan of it. So it's one of those books where you remember the sort of culmination of little um, like pokes and prods that led you to pick it up. Um, I think I'd been friends with Jen for a year or two when I first read it and she talked about it as one of her favourite books as a really interesting book to read and analyse because it is so blatantly inspired by Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and it was also, like I said, on my dad's bookshelves. And on my dad's bookshelves, there's quite a lot of Alistair Gray. He's a pretty famous Scottish author. Um, so he's somebody that I'd always had in my mind to try. And this book did not disappoint. It is such an interesting concept. It's set in 1800s Glasgow predominantly, or at least that's where um, the novel begins. And we follow a medical student or doctor. I'm forgetting now whether he's graduated or whether he's still a student at the beginning of this novel. Um, but you know, somebody in the medical field and his friend who has brought back to life or created this woman and it's an interesting spin on the idea of Frankenstein because this doctor who in a way is the Frankenstein character not our narrator but our narrator's friend found the body of a woman who had committed suicide by um, throwing herself into a river and at the same time had also been pregnant. She, he he then takes the brain of the baby and puts it in the body of the woman in order to bring her back to life, but as a very much new life. She is a new person. It's obviously not got any scientific merit to it, but in a lot of ways, it makes you think about um, the infantilization of women and um, the independence of women, particularly in that era, because then this woman that he has created becomes dependent on him and then our narrator also becomes obsessed with her and they're both very much in love with this woman who has, you know, come into this world fully grown because she was the dead woman in body but with the mind of a child and it explores a lot of the issues tied up in that and also just reflects back on the themes of Frankenstein and Frankenstein's monster and how much Frankenstein was responsible for his monster and like the independent thoughts and feelings of Frankenstein's monster. I'd actually not read Frankenstein when I read Poor Things but I definitely think having read Frankenstein since I can reflect on Poor Things in a new way and it's really interesting to look back on and I think I'd like to reread it now that I'm, I'm saying that in this video. It's also really well written, it's kind of darkly humorous in places and one that I just absolutely flew through. Lastly, for 1992, we have a collection of poetry and that's City Psalms by Benjamin Zephaniah. So Benjamin Zephaniah is actually a poet that I have adored since I was a child. I think I was first introduced to him through um, a recording of him performing his poem about turkeys, which is all about Christmas and um, Benjamin Zephaniah is a vegan. And I would say it was probably one of like those points in my like early life where I started to consider my own meat consumption and how I personally felt about that because I did become a vegetarian at quite a young age 
age. And I don't think that's the only way that Benjamin Zephaniah's poetry has been quite influential on my life and I've continued to consume it as I have aged with each decade. And I think I read this poetry collection specifically again in my 20s. But it's not the only one I love and adore and it's actually not the only one that came out in the 90s but I think of the ones that came out in the 90s that I've read. It's my favourite. Uh, off the top of my head there's also proper propaganda but City Sam's I came to when like I said I was a lot older than when I first came across um, turkeys and Benjamin Zephaniah is a performance poet. He really shines when it comes to speaking his own words and um, being in that environment but City Sam's is still a poetry collection that I think has a lot to offer in a reading environment. Like I read this, I did read some of it out loud to myself rather than listen to the poet read it himself but I still got a lot from it and it's also a very very explicitly political collection and I love political poetry and I think some of um, Benjamin Zephaniah's like strongest political poems in terms of like poignancy and depth and like evocation of emotion. In a lot of instances it deals with racism, it deals with specifically like racism in Britain and um, the kind of legacy of British racism and Benjamin Zephaniah's own experiences growing up as um, a black man and a black boy in Britain and he also comments on a number of other political events throughout this collection and does it so well. I find this book to be very accessible in terms of poetry and also very accessible in terms of politics and political thought so it has a lot going for it and it kind of sums up why I love Benjamin Zephaniah's poetry in a lot of ways. But next up is actually a book I read in the 90s because it's a children's book and it's an absolute modern classic of children's literature which is of course The Secret of Platform 13 by Eva Ibbotson. Now this book has actually been cited as a direct influence on She Who Shall Not Be Named and that series. The Secret of Platform 13 though is an absolute must read for children and adults alike. This book is so creative, so imaginative and so fantastical. I never owned a physical copy as a kid um, but my library had it and I used to take it out over and over and over again. I even think they had the audiobook on cassette tape which I also used to borrow and listen to because I feel like I can hear the voices in my head. <laughs> and it's about a little boy who's raised in the mortal world um, by humans and for all intents and purposes he thinks he's a human until a very special day when a portal on platform 13 opens up and once again allows the creatures and um, people of the magical world to enter in to the human world and they have a very specific task this time which is to retrieve their long lost prince who was left there 11 years before when he was just a baby. At least I think it's 11 years. I mean, that's not really that important a detail, but of course um, we have then an adventure of this young boy finding out who he is, mistaken identities, ogres and trolls and hags and other magical folk. And it's so wonderfully imaginative. Eva Ibbotson is an incredible writer. I've read more of her books than just this one and loved every single one. She really is my childhood in a lot of ways and I still think this very much stands up to um, a reading as an adult if you're watching this as a grown-up. Next up we have a book that came out in 1996 but which I read as a 16 or 17 year old in secondary school and that is Alias Grace by Margaret Atwood. So this is a historical novel which very much I think introduced me to the idea and concept of the unreliable narrator and how much fun that can be to read. It's based on true events around a murderess who was convicted for the murder of her employer and another woman in the household during the 1800s but who maintained her innocence. And this book takes place over two timelines. We have the timeline in which our narrator, our murderess, is um, under house arrest. She has been locked up because of her crimes and is awaiting either her sentencing or her trial. I can't remember exactly um, what she's waiting for, but she's being sort of examined by doctors and quizzed by lawyers, etc, etc. Then we also have her earlier years. So her, you know, sort of working years, her time before she ends up in the employ of this man and her time in the employ of this man. But throughout these earlier years, before the time in which she is arrested, she has this friend, she has this best friend who she constantly talks to. And this book just constantly has you wondering what is going on. 
is this woman a murderess? Is there something paranormal at play? Is there something psychological at play? Is she a liar? Has she forgotten the events herself? Does she know exactly what happened? Is she innocent? Was somebody else involved? And nor does it necessarily give you any substantial answers. More than anything, it just continuously introduces new questions and like builds the lore around all of these different theories. It could be one of multiple endings, but it's so much fun to go on the journey because it's so fascinating and compelling a narrative. Mark Arwood writes very, very absorbing atmospheric stories and this is a fantastic example of that that I would highly recommend. I've still not watched the television adaptation of it so let me know if you have and let me know if it's any good because I know Anna Paquin's in it and I do really enjoy her as an actress. We then have Hogfather by Terry Pratchett. So there were a few Terry Pratchett books I could have included in this video because he had a few come out in the 90s including Small Gods, Soul Music perhaps and Small Gods is actually the first Terry Pratchett book I ever read but when I was looking at the books I'd read of his that had come out in the 90s I really felt like Hogfather stood out because Hogfather is such a quintessential example of Discworld humour and the Discworld world. <laughs> that seemed a little bit redundant. It probably is my favourite of his that came out in the 90s. Plus, it's a Susan and Death novel who are two of my favourite characters. So in Terry Pratchett's Discworld novels, Death is um, an anthropomorphised being, you know, the Grim Reaper. And Susan is his granddaughter who lives on the actual Discworld itself, living a generally ordinary life, although it's Susan, it's never going to be that ordinary. And she is definitely one of my favourite Discworld characters. She is so sassy and sarcastic and dark and broody and wonderful. Such a clever creation of a character. Death is also always very entertaining. And this book specifically revolves around the kind of holiday season <laughs> in the Discworld. Hogfather is, of course, the Discworld equivalent of uh, Father Christmas and it's a culmination of lots of fun elements of Terry Pratchett that adds a lot to the world and the lore around it. It's not necessarily a great jumping in point. I would say if you were interested in reading Hogfather you would be better to start with Reaper Man which is the first book in which death features prominently as a protagonist. So next up is actually one of the first books I read because of booktube and that's Kissing the Witch by Emma Donoghue. This is a short story collection that I first picked up because of my friend Lena talking about it. I remember her talking about it on her channel and I only just started booktube so I was looking for more books to read because I hadn't been reading as much in previous years and picked this one up and it did not disappoint. This was a phenomenal collection that I have been meaning to reread for years. And one video idea I do have is where I reread some of my favourite five star books from the first year I was on Booktube because that's very much when I started rating books on Goodreads and giving them star ratings. And seeing what I think of them now, this is one that I 100% think I will still adore because I remember it being phenomenal, it's such an interesting concept and I've read more of Emma Donoghue since and consistently enjoy her work. This one is specifically a series of interconnected short stories, although they can be read separately, that retell traditional fairy tales but centering the women. And all of these stories, at least the vast majority of them feature sapphic romances, either between princesses and other princesses, sometimes princesses and the witches who are traditionally villains of their stories, and other characters as well. What always happens, regardless of whether there's a sapphic romance however, is that a woman is the saviour. Women in these stories either save themselves or save other women, they are not saved by men and it's a really, really fun take on these fairy tales with Emma Donoghue's very lyrical, beautiful prose. Love, love, love this collection and really do need to reread it. The next book on this list came out in 1997 and it's a little bit different because it's actually an academic volume and that's not traditionally a genre that I've talked much about on this channel. Not because there aren't tons of academic volumes I love or adore, but because I don't necessarily consider them the most accessible books. If you're not already a student or academic or somebody very much ingrained in the subject area, even if it's just you reading a lot about it in your own spare time, then they're not necessarily the places I'd suggest starting with a topic. And this one is specifically an ancient history textbook called Rape in Antiquity. So this is a volume of essays 
all on the topic of sexual violence in ancient Greece and ancient Rome and it was edited by Professor Susan DC and Karen Pierce. Now Susan DC is actually one of my PhD supervisors and another reason that this book means a lot to me is not only its role in um, my own sort of development as an academic but because I am currently one of three editors compiling the second volume in this series so either later this year or 2023 Bloomsbury is publishing a second volume following on from this looking at much more recent research in this specific sub genre of classical scholarship and I have contributed an essay and have been one of the editors of the volume along with Susan and Jose. And not only was this book very pivotal to me when I first read it and I read all the essays in it but reflecting on it as a scholar and sort of incorporating it into my own research and thinking back on what's changed in this field since then has given me an even deeper appreciation of it and it is a very important tome. They're all very well written articles that did something really important at the time because there really wasn't a volume or book like this before rape in antiquity and it's a really really important topic exploring sexual violence throughout history because it has both a relevance to our understanding of history and today so I think this was like I said a really important volume I think it's really really interesting some really incredible essays in there some which I do very much agree with and have been like I said pivotal to my own research and I'm also so very flattered and honoured to have been invited to be part of the second one so if you are interested in ancient history this might be one you want to pick up like I said it's maybe not necessarily one to jump in with if you have literally no background in the topic but you know if you've already read quite a few like beginner introduction books to ancient history and want something a little bit more or nitty gritty on specific issues then go for for it or if you're a scholar or if you are generally interested in the study of sexual violence throughout time and throughout history this might be a good place to start to look at its study in antiquity. We have two more books however one from 1998 and one from 1999 the first of which is actually the first volume in the Fruits Basket manga so a little bit different from the rest of the books in this video it's the only graphic work but Fruits Basket is very much the manga series that got me into manga and probably anime in general. I mean, I watched and adored card captors as a kid, but didn't necessarily then carry on watching more anime afterwards. But I started reading um, Fruits Basket because my library had issues of it when I was a teenager and I enjoyed comic books. So I thought, hey, I'm gonna give <laughs> manga a shot and fell in love. So then ended up watching the anime as well and carrying on watching and reading more manga and anime. So it started a real appreciation for those genres and those formats for me and I do think that this is a really great entry manga if you're looking to get into manga and it's all about a high school student called Toru Honda who has become homeless. Her mother has passed away leaving her entirely alone in this world and she ends up living in a tent and just you know getting ready and going to school every morning until she is discovered by one of her fellow students Yuki and Yuki invites her to come and live with him and his family and she quickly realizes that their family is not like others. In fact, they have a curse placed upon them that means whenever anyone is hugged by somebody of the opposite sex, they turn into one of the animals of the Chinese zodiac. Because of this, they live quite a sheltered life. They maybe don't have the best relationships outside of their family, but also don't necessarily communicate very well within their family. And Toro really, really really appreciates family and family means a lot to her because she was so close to her mother and together they managed to all open up one another's worlds and support one another throughout the series. Then last but not least, don't worry it wasn't going to escape my notice that this book came out in the 90s, is Daughter of the Forest by Juliet Marillier. So this book first came out in 1999. I only read it for the first time I think three or four years ago now and it is one of my favourite books of all time. So bow down to the 90s by the very fact that this book came out. It is fantastic. It is a medieval historical fantasy novel set in Ireland and 
Each book in the series follows a different member of the Seven Waters family over a few different generations, but book one follows Sorcha, who is tasked during this book to reverse the curse that has been placed upon her six brothers by their stepmother. Now this is a retelling of a fairy tale, but it's a book that takes a fairy tale and makes it entirely its own. This is such a beautifully written story, and it's also a fantasy novel that I feel like can be appreciated by non-fantasy readers because it's very grounded in our historical setting. Yes, we have a curse. Yes, the Fae enter into the story, but our protagonist is a human woman. And Sorka is one of the strongest, most resilient, most impressively well-developed central characters of a novel that I've ever read. And this is... And, I, and I'm talking about a character who barely speaks throughout this novel for one reason or another, but we do hear her in her monologue and how she's feeling and what she's experiencing and the task that she has been um, set to undertake and her, you know, struggle through it. And it's so beautiful, so lyrical, so detailed and atmospheric and rich, and I love it. I've talked about it a million times and I'm glad that I get to talk about it again. So those are the top 10 books that I've read that came out in the 90s. My 10 favourite books from the 90s. I hope you have enjoyed this video. I'd love, love, love to know some of your favourite titles that came out in the 90s. Maybe there are some other fantastic pieces of 90s literature that I have yet to pick up. Let me know. I'd also be interested to hear if you'd like to maybe see another one of these. I thought this was really fun to film, so maybe a sort of noughties list or a 2010s list. Let me know. But until next time, happy reading and I'll see you all again soon. Bye everyone!